Good afternoon and welcome to Clinical Pearls. I'm your host, Curry Bordelon. Today, we're excited to have a special panel of UAB School of Nursing faculty to, to discuss how we are using telehealth to serve vulnerable populations during the COVID-19 pandemic. Let me introduce you to each of our panelists. Dr. Candace Knight, Assistant Professor and Director of the Nurse Family Partnership of Central Alabama. Dr. Deb Bowers, Instructor and the Change Lives Matter Clinic Director. Dr. Michelle Talley, Assistant Dean for Graduate Clinical Education and Director of the PATH Clinic. Thank you all for being with us today. As we get started, uh, tell us more about each of your clinics and how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted you at work. Dr. Knight. Hi, Curry. Um, so our clinic serves um, the maternal child health population. We, our clients are pregnant and parenting. Um, in Jefferson County, we are, um, we serve only first time mothers, but in Walker and Fayette counties, we serve women who have had more than one baby. Um, our clients are um, high risk and vulnerable population, um, typically due to poverty, but often because of other um, comorbid um, conditions that they may have. Um, it's a local implementation of a national um, a national service called Nurse Family Partnership that has been around for about 40 years. Um, it is the gold standard of home visiting and we typically see our clients in their home or in their community where they feel, feel comfortable. Thank you. Dr. Bowers. Hi, Curry. Um, our clinic is a partnership between the UAB School of Nursing and the Foundry Ministries and Changed Lives Christian Center. And they have facilities that house men that are recovering from substance abuse disorder. And our clinic offers primary care for them, an urgent care walk-in clinic every week in the evenings after work. And then we also have a clinic for the community monthly that's a walk-in clinic for anyone in the community that might need urgent care or primary care. And we treat a number of different disorders, um, ranging from high blood pressure to type two diabetes, to an acute infection, a minor injury, um, bronchitis, pretty much anything that you would see in an urgent care or walk-in clinic. Excellent, thank you. Dr. Talley? Um, our, the PATH Clinic is um, a clinic that provides health care for adults in um, the Jefferson County area as well as statewide who have diabetes. They have to be referred by UAB Hospital because the PATH Clinic is a partnership between the UAB School of Nursing and UAB Hospital and Health System. So the hospital refers these adult patients and that's why we can have a catchment area that's a little bit larger than Jefferson County, but they have to be a UAB patient. They have to be um, have uncontrolled diabetes. They have to be a, an adult and they have to be at high risk for readmission to the hospital. And they also have to be uninsured. Um, we are located on UAB's campus. And so um, it's in close proximity to the hospital and emergency services. Excellent, thank you. So Dr. Talley, tell us, um, so COVID, this has impacted pretty much every level of healthcare uh, throughout our communities and the United States and the world for that matter. How has COVID impacted your population uh, there at the PATH Clinic? So we routinely saw patients um, in person and we have an interprofessional team of providers that provide care when the patients do come to our office or our clinic. And so when COVID hit, um, across the nation, we knew that this was going to impact the way that we were providing care. So we knew we were going to have to go from in-person visits to some form of telehealth. And so um, we were planning for that closure ahead of time. And then once it occurred, we um, went to a telephone model of telehealth. And we had experience in the past with utilizing telehealth through Dr. Eric Wallace's um, Health Service Foundation grant. 
where he incorporated five of our high risk patients into his telehealth services. We learned a lot from that implementation or pilot work. We learned that our patients have a have difficulty with connectivity from Wi-Fi and the technological issues that can um, go alongside using technology like that. So when COVID hit, we knew we were going to have to switch to um, telephone visits as our method of telehealth. So how receptive was your staff? How how did you prepare your staff and the other providers and to get them to that full transition of tele, telehealth based care? As I mentioned, we had been planning for that. We had um, also in the past done telephone calls to patients if maybe they had an appointment, it was a month out and we wanted to check on them. Um, we would set them up for an appointment and call them on the phone within two weeks just to check on blood sugars or something like that. So our nurse practitioners and our physicians and students were accustomed to that um, modality of care. However, we have a very robust interprofessional team that includes um, medicine, nursing, um, physical therapy, optometry, um, uh, public health, dietitians, And so we had to figure out a way as well as our psych mental health services. We have behavioral health services for our patients as well. So we had to figure out a way to reach those patients um, together. And I, I, I honestly, we haven't quite figured that out um, as our interprofessional team tries to work you know, work with patients. Um, we call the patients individually, and um, but we, we're trying to figure out ways in which we can incorporate the group into group calls. But let me go back and explain how we do that. So our staff, our dietitians, or another member of our staff will call the patient the day before their appointment, tell them that the nurse practitioner or provider will be calling them the next day, and then they will make sure that they know that they should be available during a certain time that the provider will be calling. The provider then calls the patient and conducts the telephone visit. And then um, we package, as you can see in the video here, a, um, a little package for the patient that it includes either medications or supplies. And then we set up delivery times for that. So that's how we're conducting our visits now. Excellent. Dr. Bowers, let's talk a little bit about uh, COVID and the transition, you know, how COVID impacted your specific population and the transition into care. How did you continue the care within your, uh, within your, your population? We faced a very unique challenge in transitioning um, during the COVID social distancing requirements because our facilities are also residential facilities for the men that are in the recovery and rescue programs. So having the community come into, so to speak, their home was not best practices. So what we did was, first of all, we brainstormed for about 72 hours of all the options. And we had never utilized telehealth before now. And we decided to do um, purchase some screens that could be set up for separation. And then we accessed the telecare hub room in the School of Nursing and um, began to have providers service clients needs from there and have stations set up at the actual facility that had some soundproof and uh, barriers for privacy. And we also had each station set up where each client could, with supervision of a nurse presenter, could check their own vital signs. And that limited the amount of interaction um, in the facility and it limited the number of personnel needed and it provided the social distancing required. Excellent, thank you. So Dr. Knight, with your population, you mentioned earlier that you do in-home visits and uh, as with your colleagues, Dr. Bowers and Dr. Talley, uh, you've had to transition um, to an alternative method to providing care to your patients to continue that service. So how did COVID specifically uh, affect your population and how did you adjust to a, a distance type except um, availability of care. So we were um, we were really lucky to be able to have had some experience prior to COVID with telehealth. Um, with the NFP model, we were able to connect with our clients through um, through telehealth on a limited basis um, before. But um, with COVID, we had to to shift to an exclusive COVID model. Um, we use all different modalities to connect with our patients depending on 
what they have access to, what types of technology they have access to. Um, it's, it's a little different than being in the home. Actually, it's a lot different than being in the home. But we have found that our clients have been very open to, um, to connecting through technology. We use everything from texting to a traditional phone call to FaceTime to Zoom meetings. Um, and so it's, um, it's, been, it's been a different experience, but we actually found initially that many of our clients who we hadn't seen in person in um, a month or more were um, eager to reconnect through the technology. Um, one of the other things that's been very helpful for our population is that um, NFP nationally has gotten a contract with Verizon to provide um, iPhones to clients who did not have access to that technology. Uh, that has allowed us to be able to FaceTime or um, connect with them through that phone um, with, uh, with service for four months. So um, we're really excited about that. So how did you get your staff and providers up and running to, because, you know, it was a pretty rapid transition from, and I know you, you mentioned that you had telehealth, some telehealth experience within your, uh, your environment before, how did you get them full, to a full transition of telehealth? Well, Curry, one of our concerns um, initially was privacy uh, because very often we talk about topics with our moms that they wouldn't want just everybody to, to hear or to know about. Things like domestic violence, mental health, um, just a, a number of things that are specific to our population um, that they wouldn't want anybody to know. And when we're live in person in the home, we're able to to see, you know, physically see who's there and um, and know who can hear us and when it's appropriate to have those kinds of conversations. So um, we had mo many conversations with our staff around um, being sure that the client um, is open and willing to have those conversations um, at that time and maybe sending a text or an email prior to our video conference or telephone call um, just to make sure that they are um, aware that we might talk about um, situations like that so that there is no breach in confidentiality and we're not putting our clients in danger by, by talking about some of those things. How receptive were your patients to the transition to telehealth? And do you feel like they they would want to continue uh, to use telehealth as an access point? Yeah, um, it's been very individual um, as far as patients receive it. Some people, I think, we've discovered that some of our clients are phone people, um, and some are not. So while um, I think almost all of our clients are anxious to get us back um, doing in-person visits, um, we have definitely had. Um, a large degree of success connecting with our clients virtually. Um, however, we have noticed as, as COVID has kind of drug on here in Alabama um, and really increased some fatigue with our clients with, um, with connecting virtually. I think everybody, including our nurses, uh, is, are, we're all anxious to get back, back to those in-person visits that we want to do so with um, all safety in mind. Excellent. And I'll, and I'll ask the same sort of question from each of the other, our other panelists as far as the receptiveness of your patient population to transition to uh, a completely telehealth based uh, care access. Dr. Talley? Our patients have been very receptive and have really um, liked the telephone visits. Um, they, there are many social determinants of health um, and barriers that they have to accessing care. So if they don't have to rely on transportation to get to the clinic to conduct the visit or complete their healthcare visit, they're loving it. Um, that said, um, we have multiple providers providing care. So the only drawback from providing this type of telephone visit is that they may have several phone calls in one day from several of our interprofessional team members. So um, they do get, as um, Dr. Knight mentioned, fatigue or telephone fatigue from the visits, but they have been very receptive to this. In fact, our show rates have increased with our providers, um, the NPs and, and MD providers, our show rate has increased in keeping their appointments. Can you explain a little bit more about what, what you mean by show rate? 
Sure. So that's the completion of the appointment from the time of scheduling. So if we schedule a patient for an appointment and they actually attend the appointment, whether it's in person or on phone, we call that a show rate. And so in the past, our show rates for in-person visits were around about 73, 75%, which is um, equivalent to populations who are insured. In fact, a little, a, a little bit better um, in, in some comparisons to patients who have insurance, but um, that's how we calculate show rates in our in our area um, or in our clinic is, is by the amount of scheduled versus completion. Excellent. Dr. Bowers, let's talk about your population for a little while. How receptive were they to a movement to an all technology-based um, telehealth system? Our population has been very receptive and one of the benefits of telehealth for our population is that because we have two sites that we operate, we can actually have access for all participants at both sites every time the clinic's open, rather than they have to wait a week for us to come to the other site to see anyone. So um, they've been very receptive and our um, new clients that um, we've been intaking a number of new clients over the past few weeks, um, they've never had any other opportunity to connect with us for healthcare other than telehealth. So the new clients seem very pleased with it. And the clients that transitioned from seeing us in person to seeing us in telehealth, at first they were a little tentative about the tablet because we actually use a tablet with audio and visual capabilities so they can talk to us just like we're in the room. Um, but after the first couple of visit, every, visits, everyone seems to be pleased with it and they like having the additional access every week. Excellent. So we've touched on a couple of things uh, when it comes to uh, the transition. Uh, COVID has affected your clinics and so forth and the transition into a technology, distance technology uh, formatting. So as we, as most all of us know, that there's significant barriers to that when it comes to rural communities uh, having access, having access to the technology, and so forth. How did you bridge that gap with those population areas that either don't have access to internet and within a personal home, or even within a community or an environment, or do not have access to the technology to be able to access their provider? So how did you bridge that gap within those populations, Dr. Knight? So, um, Curry, you're right. A lot of our population um, lives in a rural community, especially those in Walker and Fayette counties. And, um, and it, connecting with Wi-Fi is very difficult for some of them. Um, often they would have to go to a public place like a library. Um, so, unfortunately, with those clients, we have not been able to do as much of the video conferencing calls, um, but we are using texting and um, telephone calls that can be conducted over a cellular service. Um, so that's the way that we have managed with those clients in our rural populations. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bowers. We actually have um, a wonderful relationship with the IT director at the Foundry and he's partnered with us to help us overcome some of our challenges with bandwidth and we purchased some wi-fi extenders and we're able to move the location of the stations closer to the wi-fi hub that way we have had no issues at one site whatsoever connecting with audio and video the other site however that's a, that's more rural in coleman um, we have been able to connect with one spot in the facility with no issues and um, we're working on getting an additional um, Wi-Fi booster there or a hotspot so that we can have three um, stations, so to speak, up and running at all times when the clinic's open. So what we've been able to do so far is take the clients that are the most acute or the with the uh, greatest need, and they would be at the station that has the best Wi-Fi reception where we can see them and talk to them as if we were in the room with them. And then this, the clients that just need a refill and have no new problems, if we're not able to connect because of the bandwidth limitations, we're using smartphones. Excellent. You know, we were talking earlier with Dr. Talley and she, she explained greatly how, you know, show rate is very important when it comes to a community uh, to access and to continuity of care and so forth. 
What kind of show rates, if you will, if I may use your term, uh, Dr. Talley, have you seen in your other areas, Dr. Knight and Dr. Bowers? So Curry, I know for us, um, we initially saw increased visit numbers and um, we don't call it show rates, but um, completed visits. Um, so I think it's sim a similar concept. Um, at right now, we're a drop in those in those rates. Um, we have started a new, um, or actually expanded one of the things that we, we did initially um, with COVID. We were delivering emergency supplies, things like diapers, wipes, formula, um, initially before our moms were able to get connected with unemployment benefits for those who had lost their, um, their jobs. Um, and right now, we are expanding that to a contactless delivery. Um, those developmental supports that we typically um, deliver to our clients in person visit, um, and also taking out patient materials and, and dropping those on the doorstep. Um, and actually, just spoke to our nurses earlier, and they said that this week that has really increased engagement. So we're hopeful that the combination of telehealth and then delivering of the materials will continue to increase our numbers. Excellent, Dr. Bowers. What about in your population? In our population, uh, we have the clients that have been long-term patients in our clinic, and we've been able to maintain a relationship with them as they've maintained their participation in the recovery program. However, unfortunately, with the of COVID and all the other uh, challenges that these individuals are facing in their recovery, some of them have elected to no longer participate in the program. But what we've seen is as soon as they decide to come back to the recovery program, they become our clients again in the clinic. Um, so they've very, been very receptive. We've been able to retain them once they return to the program and some of them have already. And then we have a number of new clients I would say on average about five new clients that are joining the program weekly and um, we've been able to maintain um, a relationship with those in the community that come for the monthly drop-in clinic as well and keep them on their medications. So the majority of our clients have been either new clients or um, clients that we've seen for up to a year or more. And we've retained them. Um, and then uh, one of the things that's really beneficial to our partnership with the recovery is that they can be seen by a primary care provider for their primary care health needs the very week they join the recovery program. So if they have another health need other than their recovery from substance abuse, we can address that within seven days of them entering their program. Excellent. So aside from uh, Dr. Bowers, aside from treatment compliance, which you illustrated uh, there, what other outcome improvements have you seen in your population? Um, as you've transitioned to a higher access point from uh, telehealth? One of the things that we have noticed um, with our population as far as outcomes, we have a number of clients that have hypertension. That's probably our number one diagnosis. And we have been able to stabilize them. And in some cases, we've changed their medications and um, we've spoken to them about diet, and lifestyle changes. Um, another very common diagnosis is insomnia. And so one of the things that we've been able to do is not only have someone on a non-habit forming sleep aid, but also counsel them on sleep hygiene um, because um, they're a tra it's a transitional housing. There's a dormitory situation. And a lot of our clients struggle with being able to get enough sleep. So we've been able to see improved outcomes. They report they're sleeping better, their blood pressure's better. Um, but um, then also the diabetic population that we serve, we treat them, but if we're not able to achieve the outcome that we were hoping, the target that we were hoping for the hemoglobin A1C, then we partner with Dr. Tally at the PATH clinic and she helps us to stabilize that client. Excellent. Thank you. And we're going to we're going to dive a lot more into uh, collabor uh, collaborative efforts between all of you uh, very shortly. But Dr. Tally, can we talk about your outcomes in your population at your clinic? Have you seen an improvement? And if so, in what areas? Sure. So we have seen um, 
we track outcomes on a regular basis. We track them before COVID and then since COVID, and com we have been comparing those outcomes. One thing that we know that has changed since um, since COVID-19 is the frequency of using or utilizing the emergency department for routine services. Okay, so, um, you know, you might say, well, maybe that was because people were scared to go into the emergency department. Yes, that is true. Um, we um, know that that the population in general, whether you're uninsured or not, may have been fearful to go into the emergency room due to COVID-19. But we do know that even admissions to the hospital have decreased um, since COVID-19. We have put measures in place to, to prevent that. So we have made um, very um, pointed efforts to deliver supplies to patients or meet them to get supplies for patients because we knew that Prior to COVID, one of the most frequent reasons patients in our population who are very vulnerable go to the emergency department is because they ran out of their insulin or they have had run out of their supplies. So if we deliver those, we are preventing them from going in. So we um, those outcomes, those financial outcomes, we track and we know that. Our clinic in, in general saves the hospital and health system about um, anywhere between 1.8, 1.9 to 2.2 million per um per year or per every time we do the analyses. So we're tracking that on a yearly basis now, but we know since 2015 to present, we've saved the hospital and health system 1.9 um, million um, as far as the bottom line goes. Um, and then clinical outcomes will continue to measure as well. Excellent. Dr. Knight, can you share us uh, any of the, the improvements or outcome improvements or, or what outcomes you track are more uh, attuned with since we've transitioned over to telehealth. Yeah, so Curry, we, we were actually really concerned um, as we transitioned over to telehealth about um, some of our specific outcomes like breastfeeding initiation. So we have um, fortunately had a really great breastfeeding initiation rate with our population um, up to 84% um, in Jefferson County, which is much higher than the, um, the county rate. And um, we were concerned without the in-home hands-on um, lactation support that we would see those numbers drop. Um, we have not seen those numbers dropped and have been really pleased that um, our moms are open to telehealth um, visits with our lactation consultant. Um, one of the other things come on this, I have actually heard this reported nationally with NFP clients that we have found that some of our clients are actually more um, open to discussing some of those sensitive subjects um, over the phone versus in person. Um, and that can, will vary from person to person, but we're hopeful that that trend will continue and we plan to continue to use telehealth. So that was my next question. Are you going to plan to continue using telehealth after we get back to some phase of phase of normal? Yeah, I know for our population, we absolutely will. It um, It's very convenient for our clients and they definitely are very open to um, the use and we will be able to continue to connect with clients over the long term um, once they are no longer on um, uh, maternity leave and go back, back to work or back to school. So it's great for our clients and we'll continue to use it. Excellent. Dr. Bowers, will you continue to use telehealth within uh, your environment as well? once we get back to a point where patients can come in or you can actually go see them uh, face to face? We will. Um, we have discussed with our site directors the benefit of having um, within a week, no matter what site they're in, be able to be assessed by one of the nurse practitioners and um, resume whatever medications they the client may have for chronic diseases. So we're actually going to go to a hybrid model where we'll be on site quarterly in person, but every other week we're going to see clients in telehealth setting um, because that way the clinic's open to both sites simultaneously instead of one site or the other. So it um, for the 80 bed facility in Coleman, it gives any of those residents out of an entire quarter, there's only one night that we're not accessible for them out of the week, out of the weekly clinic. So it's a it's a big difference in access for those clients in Coleman. Excellent. Dr. Talley, what about your for your patient population? 
Yes, definitely. We will continue to use some form of telehealth in the future. Um, we are going to be utilizing data to help drive whether um, we open or in what or at how much occupancy we will have in our clinic at any particular time. We want to maintain social distancing and open when it is safe, but um, we know that as cases rise, we may decrease um, the in-person visits and increase telehealth usage. And then as cases um, lower, we may in, in increase our in-person visits. So using data to help drive the decisions that we're making at the clinic is what we're planning. But obviously we're able to reduce transportation barriers for our patients through the use of telehealth and telephone calls. So as much as we're able, we're going to continue to utilize that method. We do have and are fortunate to have grant funding for our clinic and HRSA provides um, money and funds that we can utilize when COVID-19 hit we did apply for um, changes in our budget so that we were able to purchase um, devices in the clinic and then take them to the home. And we plan to start some in-home visits when we um, have that equipment available and our staff and faculty um, will be using more of a, a telehealth model with video conferencing for that, for, especially for our behavioral health patients. We'll be utilizing that method because our behavioral health providers have shared with us that it's difficult for them to provide telehealth visits via telephone because they read so much into the patient's um, kind of their, their mental status or their depression or anxiety based on body language and other nonverbal cues. And so this has been difficult for our, our behavioral health providers to really get a feel for how their patients are doing. So those are the methods that we plan to, to use moving forward to meet our patients' needs, given this opportunity that COVID's provided. It hasn't all been negative. Excellent. So Dr. Talley, within your population, you know, I, I'm, I'm assuming most of you have an opportunity to have students within your environments. Do you, do you have students there at the PATH Clinic with you? And if so, how are, are they able to engage in that process with telehealth as well? So that could be a learning opportunity for them. Yes. In fact, this has allowed us to have more students um, through telehealth than we have in the past. So we have um, nurse practitioner students who join with the nurse practitioners to provide telehealth by telephone. And we do conferencing and um, co conference calls to conduct the visits. And then as we have incorporated undergraduate or pre-licensure students who are nursing, who are in nursing school to provide some of the behavioral health screening that we need. So we use screening tools for depression, anxiety, mood disorders, suicide, suicidal ideation, and that sort of thing. And so we're able to utilize those students and incorporate them into our calls so that they can conduct those visits. So COVID-19 has actually provided an opportunity for us to increase the students that we have in our clinic. And, um, you know, physical space does provide, you know, it, it, it has limitations. So when you remove the physical um, space as a barrier, then you can increase the student, students and um, their capacity to care. With us. How have the students been receptive to this? It has been a learning curve for both them and us, I will say. Um, you know, technology always has its challenges, but they have really enjoyed it. But, um, you know, I have uh, currently have a student that's with me who has only ever provided um, intensive care work in the past as a nurse. And so he had shared with me, this is just really strange to provide care um, by the telephone, but he's learning a new skill that he can take and use and move forward and learn from. So it's good to have someone mentor you through it, especially when it's new. So it's an, a, a great opportunity for our students because, you know, when we were going through nursing school, things like this didn't, you know, it wasn't an abrupt change in the way we cared. So they're learning to be adaptable, work on a team and, and improve communication. They see the efforts that we've put into, you know, shift roles and responsibilities and within our team. They've they've been able to witness the leadership that has had to emerge from all team members. And they've also witnessed the communication efforts amongst the team and then with the patients that are crucial to the success of any change in in um models of care that we provide. So I think it's been a good opportunity for them. 
Excellent. Thank you. Dr. Bowers, do you have students within your uh, population uh, that are there learning for clinical time? We do. Uh, we have DNP students. We have pre-licensure students. And um, I think in the future, the plans are to have some nurse practitioner students as well. But uh, the pre-licensure students have been able to come into a virtual exam room and uh, the particular course they were taking was a course that had objectives on psychiatric nursing and assessing clients. And so, of course, the clients um, all agree that they would like to have a student involved in their care. Um, and then we've actually never had any participant decline having a student involved in their care. Um, and then they were actually able to do some assessments using some standardized anxiety scales and then give the nurse practitioners their findings. Um, and so under the supervision of their clinical instructor. So I think it was a really great opportunity. And as Dr. Talley said, um, we couldn't have managed that many students if we had been in a small space in an, a, a physical exam room, but because we're in a virtual exam room, the numbers of students that could be present and either observing or actually doing the assessment or a lot more. And so it was a great experience for them. Dr. Knight, do you take students within your uh, clinical environment as well? And if so, how have they been receptive to the transition to the, the use of telehealth? We do. We have pre-licensure pre students every semester. And this semester, we're using um, the entire accelerated master's in nursing pathway cohort um, virtually in our telehealth visits. So um, I think that's about 60 students. Um, and so I know that our, our pre-licensure pre students, having trouble with that word, um, have been able to go back to the hospital for adult health schools, but uh, the pediatric and obstetric um, experiences were very limited. And so we've been able to provide them access to those patients. And, um, and like Deb said, our patients have been very open to having students join them. Um, they're pretty used to seeing them in, in person, so um, it hasn't been much of a stretch for them to be a part of the telehealth calls. Um, our nurses have had to learn a new technology as far as bringing in those students um, on a three-way call or with a FaceTime or with a Zoom, a Zoom call, but, um, but it's been a really great experience and the students have been able to do um, virtual assessments as well as um, really getting to know the social aspects of care. Excellent. So I'd like to spend some time talking about collaboration. You, Dr. Bowers mentioned earlier about patients in her population that might need a different level of specialty or care that she might refer them to Dr. Talley's to, uh, uh, path clinic and so forth. Can we talk a little bit about how you all collaborate with one another and how you're able to identify the need for someone else and how do you incorporate uh, telehealth uh, into that process of the consultation or the referral. So Dr. Knight, can you tell us about your population? So our population is a little different than Deb's, certainly. We have gotten referrals from Dr. Talley's clinic um, because we do patient type 1 diabetics. Um, so as far as referral, we don't do as much. Uh, with, with Deb, um, certainly because her population is men, um, and, and our client population is typically younger, and um, so we we don't see as much referral, but we have collaborated um, specifically with Dr. Talley's clinic uh, because both of our clinics were doing um, deliveries, and that was that was new for for them, and um, so we collaborated around how um, or what was the safest way to do that within the community. And um, it's just, it's, it's good to know that we're doing things kind of in line with each other, with our clinics. Dr. Talley, can we talk about your uh, collaboration uh, with your colleagues on the panel? Certainly. So with Dr. Bowers, we at times share patients, as she mentioned, um, where we might take over for the diabetes care and then she care, cares for the patient's primary care needs or other needs that they may have. We may um, refer to Dr. Knight when we have a pregnant um, patient who has diabetes because we don't care for um, pregnant women. So we, and in fact, uh, when women are pregnant, they do receive Medicaid through the, um, the 
through um, because they're pregnant. And then the insurance does cover them for six weeks after the birth of the baby. And so that's the time period in which we will refer to Dr. Knight. So we have shared patients um, with Dr. Knight's um, with Dr. Knight and her group as well. But I will kind of go back to what Dr. Knight said about collaboration among the providers, um, Dr. Bowers, myself, and Dr. Knight, and other faculty members at the School of Nursing. We have collaborated on ways in which we can deliver um, supplies. I reached out to her and said, okay, how are you doing this? What do we need to do? You know, what type of things do we need to think of? And then when we ran across, um, you know, some safety concerns with our staff, Dr. Knight and I had another conversation and said, we want to make this safe for our patients, safe for our staff, but we want to meet their needs, our patients' needs as well. And so she provided some pointers and tips on how she has been able to do that with her faculty and staff as well. So it's been a really good experience for us to kind of unite together and, and pool our minds and resources as well. Dr. Bowers, do you have some thoughts to add? Um, yes, we're very grateful for the PATH Clinic and our partnership. Uh, for our clients that have type 2 diabetes and that are no longer managed well on their oral medications and they have to transition to insulin. Um, that's not something that we can do at our current clinic. Um, we have a dispensary model. We do not include on our formulary insulin. And so uh, we would refer them to the PATH clinic and we have referred clients and they have met their target and they're doing well. And um, so if we had not had that access to that resource for them, we would be limited um, with their diabetic care and, and helping them meet their goal for having their blood sugar under control in spite of their compliance with the diet, in spite of their compliance with their oral medications. It just wasn't enough for them. So we're very grateful to have that partnership. Excellent. So I want to uh, ask a question that we've had from our audience, from one of our viewers. So how may we improve the telehealth moving forward? So in each of your areas, you've seen some positive improvements with patient outcomes. You've talked about collaboration within other specialties and other clinics and so forth. How can we take, how can we actually improve the telehealth that we have moving forward uh, as we continue to embrace it even beyond COVID-19? Anyone? I'll Dr. Speak Talley? Oh, Dr. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Bowers, please. Yes. Um, one of the challenges that we have had in uh, the more remote site is just related to bandwidth. And so I think that, um, you know, with telehealth and it being such a great access to care point for our rural population, um, just working to improve the technology to support it. Um, has been one of our major obstacles that wasn't an obstacle at all in our urban setting um, in, in North Birmingham. So I think that's one thing that we can do to improve it. And I think that actually um, training, we have trained our nurse presenters, which are our graduates and our uh, students that um, we had in our honors program, some of them, and some of them are students that were in our registered nurses primary care scholars program. And so they were very well prepared to take on the role of nurse presenter now that they're registered nurses in our community. However, I think having training available for more nurses would be a, a big way to support telehealth in the community. Excellent. Dr. Talley, do you have some uh, some ways that you're that you would like to see telehealth improve moving forward? Yes. So specifically for us, we're going to be working on trying to figure out again those group visits. How do we, in an interprofessional team, you know, allow the patient to receive multiple services, but during one maybe phone call, maybe one zoom session as has been used before um, and taking equipment to the patient's home to conduct the visits if we need to do that so we're looking at different ways we know that having worked with telehealth in the past we faced the same or had the same problems kind of that dr um, bowers mentioned with connectivity uh, bandwidth in the patient's homes and the tech when they had technological issues 
they were not able to troubleshoot or had no expert in the home kind of to help them. So those are things that we need to work through, maybe a little troubleshooting booklet for um, um, our patients if we utilize video or um, telehealth, other telehealth modalities other than the telephone. So that's kind of what we're looking at. Excellent. Dr. Knight. So I would second what um, Dr. Bauer said about bandwidth and access, um, especially in our rural populations. Um, I'm hopeful that this COVID crisis, one of the positive outcomes will be across the state. We will see greater access to, um, to Wi-Fi and to, um, and to um, you know, phones and tablets and those kinds of things, um, potentially related to our education system. So I'm hopeful that that will improve greatly in the near future and we will be able to serve all populations across the state with telehealth. Excellent, thank you so much. Well, during our final minute here, I wanna just briefly ask, do you have any major takeaway for anyone that has not really embraced telehealth within their clinical setting or within their practice setting? Any quick word of advice to say it's okay, uh, it's okay to try. So does anyone have any quick word of advice for anybody watching today? I can speak to that, Curry. Um, I would say having, you know, the clinic that we um, work in and that I administrate, we had no idea that we would need to transition to telehealth in a few, in a few weeks. Um, and so we actually, we actually transitioned and no one missed uh, their monthly visit. So, which was, which was quite a feat thanks to our excellent team. And I would say, don't be afraid to just take the plunge because it really makes you better. We had to analyze every decision, every bit of administrative policy, every workflow, um, step one, step two, step three in the workflow, and it made us better. So I would just encourage anyone who's considering it to take the plunge, get as many resources as you can, talk to as many people that are doing telehealth as you can, and then you learn as, as you make um, the effort, and it's well worth the effort. Excellent. Dr. Talley or Dr. Knight, you have some words of wisdom? Sure. I would say the same as Dr. Bowers. You know, just jump right in, try it, and then utilize, um, you know, rapid cycle quality improvement. You know, m watch your outcomes, see how those are, you know, watch those, intervene when you need to, make changes, and then really re rely heavily on your team. Roles and responsibilities will change, your communication efforts need to improve, and so, you know, just embracing teamwork as you work through that. Um, but, you know, we had planned and people have been planning uh, to transition to some form of telehealth, but COVID-19 forced, uh, COVID forced that uh, quicker than we had hoped or had wanted. And, um, but the results have been very um, positive. So just embrace it and blaze on. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Dr. Knight, any final words? Yeah, I would, I would absolutely agree um, with Michelle and Deb and say um, embrace telehealth. It has been a great tool for us to maintain connection with our clients. Um, that's so important. Um, and it definitely breaks down some barriers that we had seen before, especially with um, with transportation and, um, and some other things. So um, it's been a, it's been a great benefit to us and to our clients. So don't be afraid. Excellent. Well, thank you all for participating today in this uh, virtual uh, 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 meeting with uh, Clinical Pearls. We really appreciate all the very informative information from our panelists. We appreciate all the discussion when it comes to telehealth and so forth. We look forward to seeing you next time on Clinical Pearls. Thank you for joining us. If you liked this video, please remember to like and subscribe and click the bell icon to get instant notifications when we release new videos. For more information on how to get CEU credits or for more on the UAB School of Nursing in general, check out the description below. Thanks for watching.